at Dallas Contemporary in Dallas, Texas. And it is my absolute pleasure to be here with Pedro Reyes and Pia Camille. Pia Camille received her Bachelor's of Fine Arts from the Rhode Island School of Design and her Master's in Fine Arts from the Sclade School of Fine Arts. Camille's work is in the permanent collection of the Humex Collection, the Patricia Phelps Cisneros Collection, the Cottas Art Foundation, among others. She's also had solo exhibitions at Blum & Po Los Angeles, OMR Gallery here in Mexico City, Sultana Gallery in Paris, and the Basque Museum Center of Contemporary Art in Spain. Currently, she has solo exhibitions at the New Museum in New York City and at the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, which I had the pleasure of curating. Pedro Reyes studied architecture at the Ibero-American University in Mexico City. Solo exhibitions include the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, ICA in Miami, the Power Plant in Toronto, Whitechapel Gallery in London, the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, and the Guggenheim in New York, just to name a few. He has also taken part in Documenta 13, the Liverpool Biennial, the Guangzhou Biennial, Lyon Biennial, and the 50th Venice Biennale. He is also the subject of a forthcoming solo exhibition at the Dallas Contemporary, which will open in September. Within both artist practice, there's an investigation of the role of the viewer in activating and essentially completing their work, as well as a subversion of the expected economic structures. Often Pia and Pedro adopt the aesthetic language of consumerism in their practice. Here we're going to talk a little bit about these themes as well as the social responsibility of art. I want to start by addressing the role of viewer, the viewer in both of your practices because it's something that is very important to what you do. Pia, in your current exhibition at the New Museum, you actually invite people to bring in objects to complete the installation. Can you talk a little bit about that project? Sure, the show is called Apart for a Latch. And it's based on um, primitive economies, spe spe specifically the Native American uh, uh, ceremonies of, of uh, economic exchange. And the idea was to set up a type of shop um, in the lobby gallery of the museum where the viewers could um, exchange an object for an object. So the way I set that out is I um, did a, a display structure um, based on uh, grid systems that are used in um, low commerce or places in Mexico like La Merced or um, any other type of markets. And um, there was also some artistic references um, attached the related to the piece like Sol drawings or I based it also on some Magnus Martin drawings that I really like. But the idea is that the structure just sort of serves as this backbone of, of the work and then the people's participation is what really sort of makes it um, come together and come alive and um, I gave out a hundred sweatshirts for free. It was an edition of a hundred sweatshirts that had um, inscribed in the sweatshirt a exchange certificate for the donation of. So in a way the sweatshirt worked as a certificate um, with the public where I was giving away something and expecting something in return. And that's the key to potlatch economies. And the, uh, of course, there was no monetary values at the time. So um, I became interested in, in engaging with this type of exchanges where other things were being exchanged with the, with the object itself. And so in a way, I, I tried to engage with the public that way to see, um, to, to ask from them, uh, you know, objects that were significant to them that had some sort of personal history or something other than just a monetary value. And then, in a way, that would jumpstart the project. And so, um, from now until the end of the show, there will be a series of exchanges where um, people can literally use the show a little bit like a shop so they would go 
um, see the show and if there's an object in the grid that they like, they, they can exchange that object for an object that they bring in return and in that way generate some sort of economy with the public and um, we'll see how it goes. It's the first time I do a show like this. Great, and then Pedro, your project Sanatorium is actually a clinic that you've set up using volunteers and treatments that you've invented and then you have individuals come and function as patients. Can you explain that piece a little bit? <coughs> bueno, um, uh, se, se siente un poco raro hablar en inglés en México, pero eh, as a courtesy to the English speaking, we will continue in English. And just, my Spanish just is feel, really embarrassing. <laughs> just so. feels a little bit strange to speak in English here, but um, yes, I think that what uh, same as like uh, uh, I think that that listening to what Pia Camille is, that was explaining about her show and that the, uh, the I think that often you go to an exhibition space and you have you know like a just like inanimated objects in display and I, uh, for me what happened is that I have always been involved with uh, education departments of museums or schools where I have conducted workshops. And I started to found, you know, the interesting things that happened in workshops, I felt that it, they were missing in the exhibition space. So for me, it was interesting to develop a model of exhibition where you could have pieces that instead of uh, telling the story of the artist could be a platform for the public to tell their own stories. And, uh, and for instance, the sanatorium became that kind of project where you arrive and there's a reception and then you refer to different cubicles where you have therapies and you have a group of volunteers that are enrolled and keep the project in action, and they conduct these therapy sessions with the public. So you spend like 15, 30, or 45 minutes in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the volunteer. You know, like a doing, a, playing a sort of game, which is you know like a intended to have a uh, to provide a space for you to reflect about the mom, the particular moment you are in your life, etc. And I think that this has to do with uh, something that uh, Augusto Boal, the Brazilian theater director, called uh, the spect actor. So it's the spectator that becomes an actor. Uh, you, you, you provide a platform where instead of uh, being a, a passive uh, recipient, you become uh, uh, pr pr you pr start to produce content, and you start to produce material for the for the that that makes the work richer. Mm -hmm. Well, then, in the case of both these pieces, you're really trusting your viewer, and they're really trusting you. And how do you create that environment where they feel comfortable, essentially creating the work and finishing it and working with you? For me, it was a. Uh... I think it's a, a bit of a toss in the air because I don't, of course I'm interested in generating genuine relationships but I'm, I'm still not sure how, what the reaction will be in return. With the previous project where I um, also engaged in the, with the public in a similar way where I gave out pieces for free at an art fair, um, it was incredibly a, a, how would I say, very surprising the reaction because it's something that people are not used to in fairs and this type of context so they were all getting a piece for free and most people thought it was a very generous act and in that way you generate a very trustworthy nice relationship in other situations um, it kind of got the worst out of people but that also was interesting to see in return. Um, I think 
I don't know if trust is a word that you would apply for art. I don't know. I, my personal experience with art is, I'm not sure if that's what I look for in, in an art piece. But what are you looking at then as the artist with your viewers who are finishing the piece? In your piece at the New Museum, you've set up a set of rules that people are expected to follow in order to complete the installation. And so you are trusting them to follow that format, or is it something else that you're looking for from them? The, as I said, I think it's a toss in the air. It, 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 it's you, you generate, or I like the sensation of um, kind of doing something with unexpected, unexpecting results because in a way I feel that that's what I expect to get out of the work. With my public, I don't, I think as long as, I don't know if trust is the thing I want to inspire in them, but I want to work, have the work be a little bit of a catalyst and as long as it offers a space for reflection, that's already uh, have the battle won, I think. Pedro, are you looking for something similar in your practice? Um, <clears throat> yes, but um, for instance, like um, for me, participation uh, is something that the more kind of uh, rules and constraints that you have, you may it may lead to better results. I think that you know, like a, there's a, in my opinion, there's a misunderstanding. Because artists are believe, you know, some people say that artists break rules, and I think that it's quite the opposite. I think that artists impose extra rules on themselves and on other people, and uh, and and basically rules are necessary for a game to take place. Without rules, you don't have a game. So, for instance, um, often I have kind of uh, events where, for instance, like if there's an action where you have 200 people participating, how do you make that those 200 people have a voice and they have an opportunity to, 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 to feel that they're like kind of uh, heard and within a limited space of time? So for instance, I don't know, I'm... Um, to put an example, I recently did a project called Amendment to the Amendment uh, in, in the United States, which was about rewriting the Second Amendment, no? the, 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 the amendment about like the right to bear weapons. So for instance, you have like 300 people, and then you break down the group in, in groups of 10. So you have, you just, basically you need just like a big space and full of chairs and you know, like you make circles, and then people are explained that their task is to rewrite the Second Amendment, and then each group of 10 people discuss for 20 minutes or half hour about what would it be their uh, improved version of that piece of law. And you're given a paper where you have to write, because this actually is quite short, and, uh, and they have to write it. So after those 30 minutes, you pass around the microphone, and each team has to read their uh, version. And it's super interesting to see how all these different versions and inter iterations of, the, of this law, actually each, each team you know, like has like an interesting kind of a a, a, a addition or, or observation. Some are more radical. Some are just just a, a change a comma, and and uh, and so in that way you create a way where you know like you have for instance in an, in one hour that the workshop lasts, you have ten minutes to explain the activity, thirty minutes to to for the activity to take place the, the creative writing. And then another 15, 20 minutes for the sharing, no? the kind of uh, thing that happens at the end. So everybody had a chance to, to say something, but uh, you know, only the best part or the kind of collect the outcome of the productive pro collective work is then shared. But where, where when the sharing takes place, 
you don't you can you won't allow more than what it takes to read the thing because often if you pass around the microphone and everybody has it's like a kind of an open mic then someone will kidnap the microphone and speak for half hour and then you know like a, all the other people didn't have a chance to speak so you have to have certain rules i mean just i'm just putting an example about the kind of uh, because i believe that in group dynamics you have to kind of think of what will be the clockwork of participation so the outcome is interesting I, sorry. I think in that in that case i i wouldn't necessarily say that uh, trust is related to i think what you're probably speaking to uh, the way how i understand it is in your parameters it seems it's more about um rule making and that participation is um directly related to that and it, and the result is dependent on that but um when you pose the question as of as of trust my way of understanding it is uh a little differently. I think, um, I just think that it, it really, I, one idea is to, to pose it and to understand it in rule making and another is just to sort of leave it um, to the public's, to the public's sort of um, criteria in a way to, to have the public. So for example, what I'm trying to say is I'm, in a way, I'm trusting that everyone is going to participate and give a in, really interesting object to my grid, but the opposite can also happen. And it doesn't mean that I, I don't want to apply any rules, but I want to leave space for the viewer to have that choice. How much do you participate in something or how less? And it's, in my particular work, it's proven that, you know, if you get a lot of participation, then you're really tapping into a certain carencia, como se diría, como that there's you really uh, engaging in a in a fruitful way with your public because they're, you're tapping into that a certain lack of something. I'm not sure if it's trust though. It's like there's something um, missing, and then you 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 provide a hole or something for the public to feel like they can take part. That, and I, and I, in my case, I think it's, I rather leave that to the viewer in a way or if it makes, makes any sense. So then when you're talking about wearing, watching the project that you did for Freeze in New York, is the negative reaction that you received in the piece just as valid as the positive reaction? Yeah, Because for it sure. caused crazy energy throughout the entire fair. People I, were fanatic about these ponchos that you were giving out and they were trying to make deals to get them outside of the framework that you had created. Is yeah. that something that you were hoping for? That people Yeah, tried in to a way I described that project that in, I, in some perverse part of my brain, I, I wanted to tap into that. Because it's a way to expose fair dynamics. It's a way to understand the incredible uh, Carencias, I don't know what the word is in English, but las carencias that, that we perceive in this kind of environment. And yeah, we I did come across some incredibly surprising behavior, you know, and especially it had to be, you know, people that were at the top or the VIPs of the fair, or these people that we expect to act really responsibly. <laughs> and this wasn't necessarily the case for everyone, but you know, were the people that were bribing the staff to get a poncho and, you know, they had this self-righteous way of carrying themselves that, you know, they knew they had to have that peace. And I think lately my work has started to be a little bit about that, to, to tap into the idea of desire and these things that we are trained to from living in very sort of capitalist economies. Um, but I would say that uh, yeah, the, I don't want to have this very trustworthy, clear, perfectly articulated relationship with my viewer. So you value rules in an organization towards a final goal that you have in your mind that's very specific, and you prefer the chaos that comes out of the piece? I don't know if it's chaos, but I, I want to give uh, 
I think to some extent I want to empower the viewer and have him make the choice. And I think uh, we want, I, not that we, but I want work to engage the viewer in any way, positive, negative, uh, passive, active, however, but you want uh, to establish some sort of engagement. For, I, 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 you know, I, I, I think that I, it's not that necessarily a uh, uh, kind of a post view. I think that, you know, like actually, I mean, like the thing is that in, in participation, you also have a palette. You know, like it's, it's you, and you know, it's very much as in painting, you may ruin a painting by adding too many colors, you know, like I, it's so, you know, you can, if you, if you, the rules of the game can be, you know, like a, just a way for spontaneity to work better, you know, in, in the sense that um, if you, for instance, if you ask a question or if you uh, invite people to have, to make an action, uh, I mean, for instance, I, I, I don't know, another piece that I can think of is, for instance, like one where I ask people to write a secret and in exchange they can read someone else's secret, no? If I were to ask them, you know, like, write anything, that would ruin the piece because the, the, what it makes it interesting is that it's a secret, you know? And the, what people choose uh, as a secret is also very telling about the things that we don't feel comfortable telling others. So I think that, you know, like that's why, you know, but, but ultimately I have no control over the results. Uh, I mean, in the sense that I, I, I will, I all, I, you, know, you will always find a lot of surprises on what people decide to confess, so to speak. So for both of you, you're creating essentially an economy through your practice. In that piece, Giving Secrets, you're exchanging one secret for another. In your exhibition at the New Museum, people get to take a piece from the installation for giving something. What is the value of creating an economy that is held within the work and incentivizing participation through providing something in return? With my the piece in New York, I specifically did that just because I wanted to um, kind of see possibilities into uh, offering a different focus to the work aside from any type of monetary exchange, which we're very used to. Um, I think most contemporary art now has this very intrinsic relationship to its value and we tend to value work through its value and uh, and there's nothing wrong with that because as artists we kind of have to live off of our work and so of course it's okay you know that there's a market for, for art but I think that for the public it's important to start opening different fields of of uh, relationship and relationships to to objects and between people as well. Like the 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 my work recently has a little bit to do with that. How do you make your relationship to the object um, a little bit more thoughtful, a little bit more reflective, um, and then. Hopefully, in that could serve as a as a reflection of our relationships and how we establish relationships with objects and people. I don't know. I think it's a way to exchange uh, should mean something other than just monetary exchange, you know. And and this is why these economies, these primitive economies, were interesting to me. There's a really nice book called The Gift by Marcel Mauss, and he discusses lots of different type of uh, societies and, and the power in exchanging an object and that it, it wasn't necessarily uh, monetary related, but that um, there was a lot of 
um, spiritual and um, a sort of you know political, religious things that were being exchanged between between the two different people or societies, and that in a way uh, I think they're they're interesting things to focus on, especially in the type of society and economy that we're in. I don't know. I, I think that, uh, uh, like what Pia says, like we, well, there's like a whole spectrum of economies that are not based on profit, no? So it's, you not always have to be on the kid pro quo mindset. See, but, uh, you know, for instance, um, an interesting concept is the concept of excess capacity. Like, w we all have as, you know, we're all very busy, but we also have an extra time or an extra resource that we can put at the service of others and experience the satisfaction of being useful without having to have something to, to without having to be paid or or, or, or or without having you know, so generosity is something that also produces pleasure. Pleasure not as, always has to be something selfish, but you know, it's very interesting to experience or to know that we have done an action that results in something useful to other people. No, so um, I mean, in, in Buddhism they call it mudita, no, the the, the vicarious joy or compassion or you know, like a, the idea that you produce pleasure on someone else. Um, so I think that, you know, like a, a lot of, for instance, I, when I have, I often, I, uh, I, when you have an activated project, it can become like an extremely expensive project because you have to hire people. So often the option is to rely on volunteers. So if you have volunteers, I think that it's very important as an artist to think on actions that will be enjoyable for the volunteers um, or for the participants who are, you know, like uh, trusting you in the process of, you know, like I'm going to go for one or two days to participate in this collective performance. Uh, it has to be something that they really uh, be, will feel rewarded for the experience. So I think that is, is you know, like a, in, this, in those terms, you know, like a, if you're think, talking about like social sculpture, it's very important to, 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 to that there's an aspect of design about, you know, like a, where, where, where you can like have like different registers of why people will end up uh, happy for participating in such a thing, no? So it may be that they just like, Hear, like that they may have the opportunity to hear other people or to be to be listened to or to make friends or to you know like a, have an interesting experience but but um, but yeah so I think that you know like a, for me the most rewarding part has been I mean like beyond the on the kind of a feedback from the public the experience of the teams of people I have built, you know, like, a, they, like a often, you know, like a, they have told me that, you know, like a, that it was worth it to, to give that time to the project because they, they, it, it was, uh, you know, like something they, they enjoyed or they learned from. But at the same time, while you're construction, constructing these alternative economies, be it a gift economy or an exchange economy, you're also co-opting the language of consumerism in many ways. You've actually created businesses, essentially, in a few of your projects. And then you have looked at actual shops that you see around you on a daily basis to use that. Is that a strategy for making people feel more comfortable? Or is it just a commentary on perhaps problematics within consumerist culture? Selling the box? Yeah. Um, well, it's not really a business yet. No, but it looks, <laughs> but, but it looks like it. Yeah, no, I mean, like the model of business for it is like a, um, 
I, I, I eventually I hope you know I, got, I have done this project where I uh, sell cricket hamburgers like um, hamburguesas de chapulín, uh, you know, like, or the grass whopper, uh, as, you know, like, and and uh, and yes, I mean it's thought as a as a potential business. Um, and you make, but you make it I look like a business. No, you of use course, the language of, yes, of a business. Yeah, no, because you know, like the idea is that I think that you know, like something that artists do is that they can make the strange look familiar, mm -hmm. or the familiar look strange. I think that in that sense, for instance, something strange like eating a cricket, I would, I wish that could be mainstream. You know, like I wish that you know, like that we would eat insects as a kind of a, one of our main sources of protein. Mm -hmm. So that's why I use the language of the mass market and fast food staple dish, which is a hamburger, mm -hmm. with the idea that, you know, like a, that, that language of, you know, like a franchise and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and fast food uh, could be renewed by this eco-friendly source of protein. And then within Skins, which is the exhibition you did at the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, you use flat paneling, which is something that you see in stores all around the world. And you're using very familiar hanging systems in the new museum in a space that is right next to the store, sort of co-opting that, that very same language. Is it also a strategy to make people feel comfortable within that space? I don't know if comfortable, but uh, they're like uh, little signifiers or something for the public to uh, be able to enter the work or, or begin to, to have a, some sort of reflection of it. Um, I think I, I like using things that I see in our culture, and, and it's certainly a consumer type culture because it's the thing we're most familiar with. Um, but what happens after that is, is kind of a little bit, again, left to chance for me. I like the idea of constructing a third space using those very familiar references. And then uh, for that, I've always sort of relied on uh, performance and our idea of the performative and basically the sense of setting up a stage, a place where anything can happen. And in that sense, to try to uh, pose my questions or reflections of what I have uh, in this sort of fabricated space. Um, so I'm, I don't particularly, I'm not interested in, in having a very specific reference and a very specific type of commentary for uh, our consumer culture, but but if I use the same language, you know, I'm hoping that that's already a good starting point, somewhere to go, with hopes of, going back to what I was saying earlier, offering a third space where we, where things are constructed and not how we see them in the real world. Like, so in that particular show, I set up these very strange mixes of, they were somewhere between half breeds of like Frank Stella paintings with m modern interiors of houses. And there was some weird uh, busts that looked like pre-Hispanic masks. That, uh, whose shapes I got from the bus that they use for jewelry display. So it's really like a mix match of things and references hoping to generate uh, ideas around, around that. Are you also trying to create a third space where alternatives can happen to what we live in the day to day through your practice? Um, yes, yes. I, 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 um, I, I like the idea of a third space. I think that you know, like a, a art can be a place which is a kind of rehearsal space where you can test certain things. 
um, uh, is doesn't have to be like a fiction, but it doesn't have to be a reality. I would say that it can be a surplus reality, like a kind of a reality that you can mess up and like uh, f do certain experiments and fail, and then like have like test like certain utopic situations that would be impossible to, or not possible, but perhaps difficult to con to carry out. So in that way, I think that it can be a warm-up process, like a kind of a, a place where you, you put out like a, like a model that could perhaps, you know, like at some point depart from the art and become a reality, no? Uh, or if not a reality, because I think that like at least something that that ha could have like a currency beyond the sphere of art, no? So I'm, I'm in that way. I'm always trying to escape art. Also, I, I, I mean, often I am, you know, like a flirting with other spheres of culture. Or, um, yeah. So, what do you see as the social responsibility of art being? Because you're describing it as this discursive space where people can feel comfortable failing and trying out alternatives to the way that we're existing in currently. Is that what art is responsible for? Is it what you, why you make art, essentially? I mean, I think that, you know, like a, a, the question is that there's like different cultural environments and each cultural environment has different parameters to assign value. So for instance, uh, in art, even in art, you have different art worlds. No? Like uh, for instance, uh, I mean, some, a, a piece may be very well received by the critics, but have no commercial value. And then other may be very successfully uh, in terms of the market and criti criti don't have a critical backing. No? Or, then may, there may be works that are very successful with the public, but they're not like a, uh, validated by these other systems. Or for instance, like in academia. In academia, you have a way to assign value to an idea. So if it has to do with who you quote and who quotes you and which journals publishes. And then for instance, in the subject, you know the problem with often with social practice or works of art that intend to do, to have some kind of degree of effectiveness beyond the aesthetic experience. Uh, you have to then consider what are the parameters that NGOs and social entrepreneurs, etc., use to measure success, no? For instance, how many people were benefited or how many workshops were given, etc., and you have instruments to measure that. But sometimes in art you do a symbolic gesture that has more poetry and more, and then like it has like more currency, but that only 20 people participated, and uh, and then you can do like something that perhaps like would have like a kind of a socially measurable effect for a hundred people, but that is a mediocre work of art. So it's very hard to please all these environments, you know, like a. And, 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 and you know, what is important to acknowledge is that the map is not the territory, no? In the territory is reality, and that's where our efforts take place. But they will show up in different maps with different degrees of success. You know, it's not that we will do something that can be appreciated equally in all these different maps. Uh, so I think that what often happens that is best is in a way that also to acknowledge as an artist that sometimes you do some projects where you really aim for a kind of a social impact, but, that, but then you, that doesn't necessarily define your practice. You are also free to do works which are art for art's sake. And, and, and you know, like, a, because as much as there's, you know, like every artist comes up with a definition of art. That's what artists do, great definitions of art. But, you know, like even for yourself, at least in my own case, I, uh, the way I feel is that I, 
I, I, I don't want to be constrained to you know, like, okay, well, I do social practice or I do, do you know, like, because I don't think, I think that if you suddenly have a program to fulfill uh, and that where and you you expected that each of your works will have a kind of a impact in society, etc. Then it just don't work like that. I mean, like it's it's like you you have to trust your instincts. So you know, like sometimes you feel like doing just like something that will only please your exp aesthetic experience, and sometimes you really care for something that has social impact. So uh, even even the artist himself in his own opus, I think that has to be free to just like a, a, a move between those different environments. Pia, do you see your work as having a social impact or is it mostly focused on aesthetics for you? I don't know, I think Pedro put it really nicely. Yeah. I would have to agree with what he, saw, what he said. In my case, the aesthetic is always important. Um, I was trained as a painter and I've drawn since I can remember and uh, I, I would say I, I construct my work uh, formally in that sense. So there's always a, an aesthetic value for me in the work. Um, and the social, it's been very recent, so I, I have, I'm just sort of, there are things that I'm just starting to to work with, but yeah, I don't know. I, in terms of its effect, and uh, going back to your question, its social significance, or I would have to agree with Pedro. I think it's uh, it's not as simple as cause effect. I think. What made you bring it into your work as an aspect? Because it's something that you have come about quite recently, and it's something you've been working with for a long time, having a social aspect to your practice. What for me, it was the, the performative element of the work. All my work, even if they were uh, paintings or whatever, and in, in that sense, I, I suppose I, I've always gone back to minimal art because of that. I, I like uh, the work's ability to make make you aware of your body and your relationship to spaces, objects. Um, so in reflecting upon my, my experience with the work one-to-one, -one, I think I, it was natural that I wanted to uh, sort of extend that with the public and then it came also as a reflection of seeing too much art that wasn't doing anything for me. Um, too much art in pedestals and too much art that you can't talk, uh, touch or you can't have any relationship with. And, uh, and more and more we're distancing that relationship through cell phones and selfies and our experience with art is not, I said this recently in an interview, it's not what it used to be like sitting for 20 minutes in front of a Mark Rothko and having 20 minutes of your time to contemplate something. I think our experience of art has changed uh, and we have to change with it. And for me, a way to adapt that change was to start reflecting on, on, on how to communicate with the viewer and how to give them a certain amount of, uh, I hate to say it like this because I really don't think it's a relationship based on power, but more in the sense of empowering someone to have them that make that choice of, you know, how you can, what, uh, what you can make out of art aside from it being this object that's unreachable, untouchable, in a pedestal related to all this high-end values, I don't know, maybe it's just kind of, I'm being a little bit of a revolutionary in that respect, but. So then is creating interactive art that relies on a public, a strategy to keep art relevant within society? Probably, I like to think that, I'm, I'm not sure how effective that is, but. Yeah, but I think that, you know, also what is important is that, um, 
that, that the aesthetic experience is also a, a, a primary need. You know, like a, it's not that something that is a, a superfluous or, or, or a, because, I mean, for instance, like this week, uh, and, you know, like a, the artistic community is campaigning to save Espacio Escultorico. And it's, it's an interesting case, you know, like a, you, know like a, you could say, well, how, you know, like a, what happened is that finally there's just a piece of sky where a, a, bu a building is ruining the view. And you could argue that Mexico has way too many problems for us to worry about something that is just, you know, like a, uh, a, a, a you know, like a, a, a aesthetical, no? But it goes beyond that, you know, like a, a, the thing is that, for instance, like this, this artwork is quite immaterial in the sense that the actual sculpture was not damaged, but the sculpture had a, a ecological reservoir, like the Reserva Ecológica del Pedregal, which was several hectares of, you know, like a, a volcanic garden that were set there in order to create a buffer so no one would build there and you know, have the landscape and the view of the volcanoes as something that could remain the same way forever. And now they just build this, this, this building and you know, like a, a lot of people say, well, you know, like a, there was money spent on this building and, and, uh, and that's public money, it's the educational building, so how do you dare to say, let's throw it down because we're ruining the view. But it has to do with much more than that. It's, you know, like it's something that has to do about the fact that this is a masterpiece of modern art and it's a world heritage of the UNESCO. And if we just like remain, um, uh, you know, like a, uh, if you just, you just resonate to, to see that heritage lost, then something much more is lost, you know, like it's like a kind of sense of dignity and a sense of, uh, of democracy that is lost. So, you know, like a, it means that everything goes and it's not, you know, like a, we shouldn't let, let you know, like a, because then, 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 then many other things, you know, like a, will happen without anyone raising their voices. Don't you love Espacio Escultorico? Yeah, I do. I went there all the time when I was little. But I, there's a really nice photo that uh, Pedro put on Facebook. It's, not, it's a gif of the building going up and down. And it's pretty brutal. Because yeah. uh, without it, the, the contemplative aspect of the piece, the ability to see the volcano, to be in that space, what it felt like being in that space like that, is totally tainted with this construction. So yeah, in a way, I suppose, what, for me, what that building is stripping is that reflective uh, uh, space. It's no longer that, now it's like, urban something. Well, thank you, Pedro, and thank you, Pia, for being part of this conversation, and thank you for attending. Thank you all for coming, and by the way, we're going to do a meeting next Friday at the Espacio Cultural. We're going to occupy the, 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 the space uh, as a collective protest. You should come and perform. <laughs> I totally picture you there, you know, like a, with your band or something. <laughs>